Okay, we're we ready to go. I hope the sound is good and you'll be able to hear me. It'll be with pleasure that I'll be able to present this evening. You've asked me today to talk to you about hereditary colorectal cancer in Africa. And my perspective obviously is in, is, is in South Africa. Let me say that I come from the University of Witwatersrand. Probably the most significant work that has been done in South Africa has actually been done by our opposition, which is University of Cape Town. They have established a, a, a group of um, patients with Lynch syndrome, with hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, that they identified in the Northern Cape. And they have followed these patients for years and years and years. So the vast part of our specific knowledge is related to their work. So I think what we should do is we should realize that everything that we see, everything that we touch, everything that we experience is very specific to our circumstance. We can be proud of our past. We can be proud of the things that we have achieved in our national and uh, cultural memories. It's good therefore for us to go ahead and not only concentrate on what the world has shown us, but also to share with the world what we experience. It is with this in mind that I would like us to start by saying why is colorectal cancer of any importance or of any value in terms of going ahead with research and education? It's becoming increasingly apparent that there is a change in the incidence of colorectal cancer. I draw you to the attention, I draw your attention to work that has come out of IARC the International Association of Registry, Registries of Cancer, which is based in Lyon in France. It is a WHO initiative, and there's some really great works. One particular by where the first author is Melinda Arnold, and which is um, supported by Amanda Ferley and Freddie Bray. All of them really good scientists. And they have consistently shown that colorectal cancer throughout the world on the whole is going up. The incidence is increasing year on year. So if you break it down by countries, it would appear that those developing countries are the ones, are those countries where the incidence is going, going up whereas the developed countries, the incidence is going down. And it's likely that what is happening here is that everybody is now being exposed to the environment, the Western environments. And that is resulting in Western diets being, uh, being the norm. And as a consequence, the microbiome is changing. I want you to conceptualize the microbiome like a traje trajectory. Your microbiome starts when you're born. Prior to that, the gut has no bacteria in it. But as we pass down our mother's uh, birth canal, we are experiencing bacteria for the first time. The series of events that occurs after that is a stepwise incremental increase in the complexity of the microbiome. This is dependent on the events that have preceded the development of that microbiome. So in time, that microbiome's trajectory is dependent upon the environment in which that, that person is in. And therefore, the subtle changes that have occurred in the environment that define our modern circumstance means that the ultimate, uh, 
the ultimate um, nature of the microbiome is, uh, is specific. Uh, so I, I hope everybody can hear. I, I think it's, it's okay. If you can't, please just let me know. Anyway, so the microbiome is very specific. This means that we are seeing year on year an increase in colorectal cancer. The problem is, is that the incidence is in excess. And in the developing countries, the mortality is in excess. In the developing, developed world, the incidence is coming down because they have got programs of screening that are detecting the polyps early. And also, if they do detect them, they're being detected early. So T, they are stage ones and stage twos. And therefore, we are seeing not only a decreasing incidence because the polyps are removed before they become malignant, but when they do occur, they are detected early and treatment results in cure much more frequently than they do in the develop, developing world. So at this moment in time, you can make the, the point that colorectal cancer is not very common in, in Africa, but this is not likely to be where we are in say 50 years from now. And what then about these patients that we see? I think it's very important that we realize that they are a mixed group. They're not one homogenous group. In fact, increasingly now, we're beginning to think that colorectal cancer is in fact a variety of diseases all put together in one. And we're beginning to pick out the differences that we see between, patient, between our patients. And the genetic mutations, those inherited genetic mutations are one group that we can select out. And it has been identified that 80% of our patients, 80% of all those patients that present are truly sporadic. They are the consequence purely and simply of environmental stressors, and 20% of them are familial. Of those 20%, of those 20% roughly half, maybe a little bit less than half of the, that 20%, so 9% of the total, is associated with germline mutations. That varies around the world, but, but it's between five and 9% of all the cases are the consequence of a germline mutation. The, germ, the germline mutation then represents an opportunity. And here's the thing. We usually screen, well, I, let's, let's rephrase that. I don't know what it's like in your country, but there is no screening program for colorectal cancer in South Africa. And the, and the reason being, is that there, it is considered to be of low incidence. And the, co the, the cost benefit ratio of initiating a screening program has always been taken as not in favor of developing a screening program. So I don't know what it's like in Sudan, but certainly in South Africa, we don't have a screening program. But here's the thing. The familial patients and the germline mutations represent an opportunity. Because here we have a group of patients where contact tracing is an integral part of the management of the patient. So here, we don't need to go do uh, sc screening programs. We don't need to do fecal occult blood. We don't need to use the usual techniques that we have for screening. This group of patients, if we find them, we can go find those people that are at extraordinary risk of developing colorectal cancer, and we can attend to them accordingly. 
So let me digress a little bit. I want to talk to you about Vogelstein's hypothesis. I think a lot of you will be familiar with it, but it's really central in our understanding of what we are talking about when we, when we are talking about colorectal um, malignancy that is familiar. Vogelstein was the first one to point out that what is happening in malignant transformation is there is a stepwise accumulation of mutations within the cells that become malignant. And in sporadic malignancies, what is probably happening is that environmental stress, radiation, chemical exposures, bacterial um, uh, environments that are unfavorable for the colonocyte are all resulting in injury. That injury is to the DNA. The response to that is ultimately the development of uh, malignancy. The germline mutations, the germline mutations are in effect a uh, abnormality of um, the, the gene which is inherited. So in effect, what is happening is the individual with the germline mutation it has an unfavorable head start. They have a mutation which they're born with. And this is the reason why they develop malignancies at an early stage. Now, the interesting thing is then that the development of malignancies in these patients is still not only the germline mutation, but it's all the other injuries that are occurring around the patient. So I will be coming to it in the, a little bit later. The development of cancer in these patients is still dependent upon the environment in which the cell is occurring. So some, pa some patients may be in an unfavorable circumstance where they're living next to a chemical plant that is spewing out pentavalent uh, chrome, for instance. In another place down, down the Nile, they are putting cadmium into the, into the Nile. In that circumstance, that exposure will predispose that individual to specific sites of malignancy. And that need not necessarily conform to what we, we would expect in what is routine in, uh, in a colorectal patient with one of the hereditary uh, malignancies. So I think what I will be doing is I'm going to go fairly quickly through um, the book work, and that is to just refresh our memories about what we are talking about. And while I do this, I'm going to try and bring to your attention um, some of the, the uh, interesting facts about, this, uh, about these different conditions as they relate to our South African patients. So, Hereditary non-polyposis colon, uh, hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer uh, is now more specifically called Lynch syndrome. Um, th this is the group of patients that we see in uh, the Northern Cape. And in particular, it's the MLH1 group of, of mutations that we are seeing. There is some suggestion that in association with that, there are other forms of mutation which have predisposed to further predilection for the malignancy. And the Capetonians are trying to establish that at the moment. The other common colorectal malignancy is FAP. Now, this is also very interesting in South Africa. It has an extraordinary history. It's known that there was a single proband, a single young lady who came across 
in a ship in the, the mid 18th century, so about 1750. She arrived in the Cape um, about 20 years before the French Revolution broke out. And she was an orphan. And I understand that there was a program at that time to ship out the orphans to um, the colonies to deal with the increasing demand of, um, of living space that there was in Europe at the time. But here's the thing, why was she an orphan? She was an orphan because both her parents had died. And the one of them, we think, had died of malignancy. And it turned out that she had FAP. And she had three children. And that group of patients has represented a very significant component of all the, of all the FAP patients that are seen, particularly in the Dutch community in South Africa. We'll, we'll go on about that a little bit more. HNP, HNPCC then is these three gene, three potential genetic uh, mutations can predispose to it. Um, that should be, um, yeah, P, PMS is, those, sorry, those four are, are the, the, the common causes. This EPICAM is a relative new addition to the, this group of diseases. Um, and it is quite distinct from the mismatch repair genes. And it is thought to be having an epigenetic effect on the mismatch repair genes. The whole concept of epigenetics is fascinating because what I think, well, what people think is going on here is that these genes are having effect on other genes through the intron, the intronic component of genetic expression. I'm not going to say anything more than that because that, that is a whole lecture in its own right. So a fascinating uh, circumstance that we have here. Epicam we don't see in South Africa. From what I understand, the, the biggest group of Epicam uh, patients is in the Far East. The APC gene, uh, so let, let's just talk about these, these genes. So the mismatch repair mechanism is a whole conglomerate of proteins that I will go into a little, in a little bit more detail in the near future. Um, and it is abnormalities of these, these proteins that result in um, poor function. The APC, APC gene mutation, I want you to think of a string. It's a single piece of DNA. And there are various sites on that DNA where abnormalities can occur. So, and the amount of string that is damaged is really going to have an effect on the way in which the disease presents. Okay. We see very little of Poets Jagers. The other polyposis syndrome, and in particular, the, um, uh, the serrated adenomatous polyposis, we don't really have a very clear understanding of in South Africa. Juvenile polyposis we see, but very rarely. So I don't think I'm really in a position to talk to you about these. The two that we see are, as it is in the rest of the world, Lynch syndrome and FAP. I would also like to point out, particularly with regard to the serrated adenomatous polyposis syndrome, syndromes, it's that we're only just beginning to understand them and a lot needs to go into them to, to have greater clarity. They are genetically really, really interesting. 
but I don't think that we're going to have the time to, to, to discuss them. Um, yeah, so let's talk specifically about Lynch syndrome, okay? Just to refresh your memory, the, the two sites that are particularly affected are the large bowel and in women, the uterus. All the rest, yeah, they occur and they're described. So there, there can be um, malignancies of the small bowel. There can be malignancies of the pancreas, malignancies of the stomach, and urothelial malignancies, malignancies of the prostate. But the real biggies, the areas where the malignancy really occurs are colorectal malignancies, endometrial malignancies, and ovarian cancer. All the rest, these are, are probably the next most common, but all the rest are really a lot less common. So much so that surveillance really is around these two. I will stress again, the presentation of the families are different. It's an extraordinary thing that in the Western Cape, they, they for a long time, didn't even bother with, with the uterine malignancies because they just weren't there. It's only much, much later in that group that they've discovered that it does occur, but that is in women that are, that are really old. So it would appear that it is all the other associated genetics of those family groups, plus the environment in which those patients are in, that defines their, um, their malignant makeup. Okay, so I bring, this is what I've already said, that the, the patient's specific genetics, the environment in which they live, is going to have an impact on the way in which they, they, their malignancy is expressed. And they're up to 20, now, now they're up to 20 associated genes that are affecting the way in which the patients present. There's a very good Dutch paper, Dutch paper that I would bring your attention to in this regard. Okay, this is relevant to me and I think is relevant to us as citizens within the countries of Africa. Let's go back historically. In the 1960s, Lynch was writing up his um, first descriptions of those patients in the Midwest where he had identified malignancies occurring with a genetic predisposition. It was around this work that the Amsterdam criteria were developed, Amsterdam 1 and Amsterdam 2. And if you go look at those, the Amsterdam criteria are really, they're, they're based on history. So we are identifying these patients with FAP by uh, recording their history and doing contact tracing on the basis of history. It became apparent that this was good, but it was, it was too fussy. It, was, it, was, it wasn't sensitive enough and it was too specific. And that sort of circumstance is one that you don't really want as a, a means of screening for patients in a given population. It was for that reason that people began to say, we need to broaden the criteria by which we find these patients. So they introduced the Bethesda criteria. And the interesting thing about the Bethesda criteria is that it's not only based on history, it's also based on, as we know, the uh, detection of MSI. They found that this was a lot better. They were picking up 
a greater number of patients because it's more sensitive, but losing specificity. And they then thought, well, let's make it even more liberal. Let's make the way in which we find these patients even more liberal than just uh, history and um, MSI. And so what they did is said, let's just look at those patients with a family history and who are, uh, sorry, less than 70 years of age, have a family history and have MSI. And, and again, they found that this was a better form of screening. And it, this was the liberalization of the Jerusalem statement. In the United States and in many countries in Europe, they have now just said, let's abandon history completely and let's just do MSI on everybody we see. And what they've found is that that is the best way in which to detect these patients. Much greater uh, sensitivity with a decreased specificity. And they, they are therefore um, detecting a larger number of patients with, uh, with Lynch syndrome in doing that. There's one other thing that has driven that desire to test for MSI. And that is the development of the PD-1 ligand inhibitors. It has become apparent that patients with mismatch repair gene have, and it's been known for a long time, they, they initiate a Crohn's-like response to the tumor. This has made people um, very, very interested and very excited at this moment in time, because what it, what it has done, what it has done now is, has enabled us to treat the, these patients by means of immunotherapy. What you need to, th what you need to understand about this drug, um, Keytruda, is it's an antibody against certain cell ligands that enable the cancer cells to hide from the immunity. And what is happening is the Keytruda unblinds the immunity. It opens the eyes of the immunity to the cancer there and enables the cancer to be attacked by the immunity. So here is an agent which if used in those patients with the P, with with the mismatch repair they can they have a really really very beneficial effect on these malignancies. And here's the interesting thing. The MSI the, the abnormality that is caused by the mismatch repair gene. Yes, it is specific. It is specific to um, uh, the Lynch syndrome, but it can also occur in sporadic malignancies. It can occur in the situation of chromosomal instability. So it is part and parcel of chromosomal, chromosomal instability. So, yes, MSI is being used to detect uh, uh, Lynch syndrome, but it is also very important as a way in which to determine whether we can give our patients immunotherapy. And this is very important. It's something that I'm seeing more and more and more in, in my work, is that it's the oncologists that are driving it. It's not the geneticists that are driving the, the, the need to uh, have all our patients tested for MSI. Obviously, it has a huge benefit both ways, both for the geneticist and, and for the oncologist. So 
what are we talking about here? I just want to briefly tell you about the way in which the, the DNA works. Um, I specifically asked uh, um, Nadia who was going to be in the audience and he said that there would be juniors. So um, please, um, I humbly beseech you, be patient here. I hope that this hits home for the younger, the younger audience. What is mismatch repair? So when DNA is replicating, it is replicating uh, as a consequence of the activity of a DNA polymerase. The interesting thing is, is it doesn't matter what the eukaryote is. It may be an amoeba, it may be a mouse, it may be an eagle, it may be a crocodile, but the polymerase always moves in the same direction. It's not the case with bacteria. There are bacterial um, uh, polymerases that go from the three to five direction. And that is actually the basis of um, uh, polymerase chain reaction, the chain reaction, the PCR um, tests. But in, in vitro, uh, um, in vivo, the, um, the polymerases always go from five to three. Now, as you can see here, as the DNA unwinds, the polymerase goes very easily in this direction. But in the opposite direction, it has to work in bursts. It has to do a little bit, the DNA unwinds, it does a little bit, the DNA unwinds some more, it does a little bit. And this, this um, repeated synthesis of DNA is dependent upon an RNA template being made on the DNA, okay, the Okazaki fragments, and then the DNA is read from that RNA and the DNA is synthesized from that RNA. Now there has to be what they call wobble, which means that the that the, the, the chemicals don't quite fit together and mistakes are made. And it is those mistakes that the mismatch repair mechanism come and say, oh, no, this is wrong. This base should not be here because it's comparing it to the other side of the, the DNA strand. It's saying these don't match up and it comes and it repairs that. And it is one nucleotide at a time, one to two to three to maximum four nucleotides at a time that are, are taken out by the mismatch repair mechanism and the correct sequence is then put in place. And it's really because of this rather non-specific approach to the way in which the DNA has to be synthesized on, on the... Um, the countersense strand. So it's on the opposite strand to the 5-3 direction. And this is the reason why it happens. What is therefore happening is there is a gradual accumulation in the, in the situation of mutation in the MMR, in the mismatch repair mechanism, there is a gradual accumulation of single, uni, bi, tri, and uh, four sequence nucleotide misreads in the, the cell. And it gets more and more and more and more as uh, replication by mitosis occurs in the patient. So it's just a matter of passage of time. So over time, the, the mismatch repair is, is the, um, mismatch repair um, mutations result in an accumulation of mutations. Now, that's what we think. That is a hypothesis. There is no direct evidence that that is actually what is happening in Lynch syndrome. And it occurs particularly where the, the nature of repeating, there are repetitive sequences in the DNA. So there are parts of the DNA where a repetitive sequence is a natural component of that DNA. 
and it's extraordinary that 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 those sequences vary in length so can you imagine ag 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 in one particular part of the dna or a a a a a a a a a a a throughout the throughout a particular segment t a p t t a g t a g t a g t a g t a g t a g and so they go there are places in the dna where they are naturally sequences and the length of those repeats are very specific to each human being. So just like our fingerprints, the length is specific to us. It's specific to where we've come from genetically. Now, we don't know why, but when there is a mismatch repair gene, it is at those sites that there are misreads and there is a gradual accumulation of the length of those sites of um, accumulated DNA. So the microsat inst instability results in those areas expanding, those repetitive sequences are being expanded. And what we are doing is detecting those in the laboratory as the way in which we, we tend to mismatch repair uh, um, evaluation. And there are a number of ways in which we can do it. We can stain for it. And here, what it is, is we're saying, okay, the mismatch repair gene is uh, MLH1, it's mutated, and the product of that mutation is a surface protein and they then develop a stain a fluorescent stain in this circumstance a fluorescent stain to that particular protein and there it is it's a, so it's a stain to the protein synthesized by the mutated by the mutated gene in the laboratory what we can do is we can then compare normal cells to the malignant cells. And what we find is we find those, accumulate, those accumulations of DNA repeats. And the way in which we do this is we look at a slide, we identify that part of the slide which we think is abnormal. The best way to dissect that out is using a laser knife to dissect out that area that you want to evaluate. That piece of tissue from the paraffin slide is homogenized. The DNA is extracted. The DNA is then polymerized. And that polymeric DNA, if it has undergone mutation as a consequence of mismatch repair, will be much, much bigger than the normal cells. What we then do is we compare the DNA of the normal cell with the key DNA of the, the malignant cell. And so here's a perfect example of how you've got the mismatch repair. You've got these, these repeats occurring a lot more frequently in a patient who has got, a, um, who's got the mismatch repair gene. And here it is. If those repeats, if those, if the differences are greater than are, are, are less than 10%, we call it MSI low, and greater than 20% MSI high. Now, this concept of MSI high and MSI low is very important because we don't really know what the MSI low means, but in the MSI high, this means that these patients, these are the ones that we want to really look at their families to determine could they be a Lynch syndrome. Okay, and going, going back, the, the staining is done by a fluorescent antibody that is an antibody against an antibody that is in turn an antibody to a specific mutated protein that is a, a product of a mutated gene. If more than, if only one mutated gene is detected, 
that is MSI low. If two or more mutations are find, found, that is MSI high. All right. I won't, won't say anything more than that. Let's think of Africa. So here we were saying that it's really very important that we determine whether there is uh, a um, whether whether the there is MSI or not. The thing that gets the geneticists really excited when it comes to deciding whether they should chase a patient is if they find MSI in a young patient. Those are the ones that they say, oh yes, no, we must really go for these. I want you just to have a look at this. Uh, this is not very well labeled, but this is this is a, a, a sample of patients from Turkey. Pretty, pretty affluent. Whereas these are patients south of you. These are from Tanzania. What I want to bring to your attention is just how much younger they are in Africa. How much older they are in the developed world. Okay. So... Here we have a situation where if we find MSI, we are going to be more likely to chase them in Africa than we are in the developed world. So it's our responsibility. It's going to be increasingly our responsibility to make sure that those patients that are MSI high are actually attended to, and more so in Africa than anywhere else in the world. Oh, well, in the developed world, our responsibility is going to be greater. Okay, and what do we do? Uh, I'm going to be running out of time, so I need to go a little faster. Um, we, surveillance, colonoscopy is mandatory, and the reason being is because of right-sided disease. The... the, the uh, the rest of the world recommends that if there is a first degree relative, if there's no first degree relative, then, uh, sorry, if the, if the a first degree relative has not been found to be MSI positive, then those colonoscopies are done every three years. All other patients that are found to carry a mutation and are part of a family are evaluated one to two years. And what we're looking for is tiny, tiny little flat adenomas. Um, and my, my Cape Tonian colleagues have become expert at this. It means that if you're going to be doing colonoscopies for these patients, it is absolutely imperative that you have brilliant bowel prep. You cannot do these programs if your bowel prep is, is useless. You have to be really, really fussy about your bowel prep. And of course, we're not the only ones that are picking them up. It's the gynecologists who are also picking them up. And they recommend transvaginal ultrasound. And biopsy is a very important component of this because they're looking for complex endometrial hyperplasia in that combination of an abnormal solon and a specific biopsy they increase the sensitivity of the pickup of MS, um, of, uh, of Lynch syndrome. And in that situation, they usually recommend, sorry, they usually recommend that what we do is surveillance every 30, uh, from, the, from the age of 30, and that is done every year to every second year. It is not recommended to do any screening program on gastro, once, once we've identified that there are Lynch syndrome, it's, there's no point in going looking for gastric cancers. There's no point in looking for pancreatic cancers. There's no point in looking for urothelial cancers or prostatic cancers. Now, the interesting thing is that in China and Japan, gastric cancers do occur more frequently in the Lynch, in Lynch syndrome. Whether this is because it's just more common in the, these patients or not is uncertain. The interesting thing is that this is one of the features of our 
Cape Town patients because we think that they are exposed to uh, processed fish a lot more than the rest of South Africa. So this may be of relevance in a South African setting. Okay, so what do we do? And this I would like to just mention is a Cape Townian perspective of the situation. We usually offer them some form of colectomy. There are those patients um, where a segmental colectomy has been done. And this is usually not a good uh, procedure because although they are less symptomatic from taking out large pieces of colon, they have an, in, a, an almost equivalent chance of developing malignancy to those that don't have a colectomy. My Cape Town colleagues say, if you're going to take out the colon, take the whole colon out and do an ileorectal anastomosis. Yeah, maybe it is specific to that particular group of patients, but that has been their recommendation and it has passed down to us in, in the rest of South Africa. We do know that NSAIDs have a favorable um, impact favorably on preventing adenomas from developing. And we also recommend to all patients that they lose weight and they stop smoking. That is thought to be further injury that predisposes the patients to develop malignancy. I'm going to go fairly quickly through FAP now. Remember that FAP, unlike um, HNPCC, is relatively easy to pick up. It, there, there are ancillary features that go with it. This CH, um, RPE, CHIRPI, uh, th this retinal hy pigmented hyperplasia is very specific to this disease. And in fact, is so common that it, particularly in uh, conventional FAP can be used as a way to pick up those patients that carry the gene in families where a, um, a, a primary candidate for the pathology has been identified. They also form. Um, 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 glioblastomas in the brain. This is part of Turco's uh, syndrome. They are likely to develop uh, uh, desmoids. These desmoids occur most commonly intra-abdominally and on the anterior abdominal wall, but they can occur anywhere on the body. They represent the second commonest cause of mortality in these patients with this condition colorectal cancer being the primary cause. Osteomas can develop uh, and they, they develop malignancies of the duodenum and the ampulla. They may also have supernumerary teeth. I have here the, the way in which these genes are mutated. Remember that I said it's like a string. So the, ver the huge variation that we see in the way in which it presents is dependent upon mutations in specific parts of this whole string of possible mutations. So a wide variety of variations can occur in this single mutation, which is the APC gene. Okay, so because of that huge variation, we can see a lot of different ways in which they can present. They can present with thousands and thousands and thousands of polyps. And when they do so, these patients present at a very early age and they have malignant transformation um, early on between 20 and 30. If there are hundreds of polyps, so not quite carpets, but lots of polyps, these usually present under 15 and these reach the age of about 30 or 40 before they undergo malignant transformation. And then very interestingly are those patients with a attenuated FAP where they present with, by definition, less than 100 polyps. So a patient, the, the diagnostic criteria for AFAP 
is if they have between 300 and 99 polyps and there are two members of the family that are first degree relatives with that situation. Or alternatively, if there is an individual with between three and a hundred polyps and what's more, they have one first degree relative with an established colorectal malignancy, we can call that patient an AF, a clinical diagnosis of AFAP. In our situation, the Ashkenazi Jewish population has, has carried the AFAP into South Africa. And we see this fairly commonly. It's interesting to keep in mind that if you see a patient with more than four polyps that are adenomas and they are over the age of 40, then always, always, always keep in mind that that is the basis of the diagnosis of attenuated FAP. Also keep in mind that there may be no family history because 10 to 20% of these patients are primary mutations. The phenotype of these patients is very distinct. So unlike HNPCC where there are all sorts of fancy tests to try and identify these patients, we know that they're there because they are very clinically distinct. Okay, so case finding is, is really easy. As I said, we, we, we can use Chirpy to, to uh, identify these patients. Um, APC gene is what we, we test for, but up to 70% of patients may be APC gene negative. And we think the reason for this is various forms of mosaicism. And that is in a single patient, there's more than one genetic expression. So we can make mistakes in, in saying that the patient... That, that a patient that a patient is uh, is APC gene negative when in fact they they are positive. Okay, and of course the various exons uh, in expression are the reasons why we get these variations in form, and in fact there is an increasing tendency for us to specify the exon abnormality to help us determine what is going to be the nature of these patients' presentation? And what do we do? In FAP, it is okay to do sigmoidoscopy because most of these polyps occur in the rectum. And if they do occur, we're going to make the diagnosis. If they are, are young, then the interval is uh, two years. That's uniform in all FAP, but we stop after the age of 50. In AFAP, where there's a much uh, lower age limit to the start of endoscopy, we, we don't specify the time in which we stop. And we must do colonoscopy in AFAP because in AFAP, you may have rights, they can present with right-sided lesions. This is the same as Lynch syndrome. Remember what we had said, it is mandatory in Lynch syndrome to use a colonoscope to get all the way through to the, the right side of the colon. The same too in AFAP. I'm going to digress a little bit and talk specifically about South Africa. So the Cape, uh, my Cape Town colleagues have established a roadshow. They, they have a bus that they pile all the specialists onto, anesthetists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, gynecologists, uh, geneticists, they all hop on a bus and they go off to the Northern Cape. It's about, it's a good 600 kilometers up the coast from Cape Town for them to get to where this family live. And it is incredibly remote. And what they do is they take their colonoscopes with them. They've got to, they can't, evaluate their patients any other way and they are very very careful that they make sure that their patients 
are well bowel prepped before they arrive. So they have nursing staff there on site that make sure that the patients are properly bowel prepped before they go. And the reason being is they want to be absolutely certain that they pick up those right-sided lesions because AFAP, like Lynch syndrome, have right-sided disease very often. Okay, so what are, what are we going to do? When, there, when do we resect? We resect, obviously, when there is a malignancy. Any patient that becomes symptomatic with AFAP, there's a 50% chance that they are housing malignancy and that colon should come out. The higher the polyp burden, the younger that you're going to do the, the colectomy. And increasingly, we're beginning to look at specific exons to determine which patients need a early colectomy. And what do I do? I do a colectomy in those patients in whom I'm concerned about fertility. I would, re I would keep the rectum and do an ileorectal anastomosis. If there is a family burden of desmoids in that group of patients, I would do an IPAA. I would do an ileal pouch. And the reason being is that if you do an ileorectal anastomosis on a patient who then develops desmoids, the desmoids causes fibrosis and stricturing of the, the mesentery. And if you've done just an IRA, you can't come along and do a proctectomy and an ileo anal pouch because the, the bowel doesn't get down into the pelvis. It doesn't reach there because there is too much scarring and fibrosis within the mesentery of the small bowel. It makes it impossible to create an ileal pouch after you've done the, the ileo rectal anastomosis. And also, this group of patients, the exon 144, 1444, this group of patients is more likely to have desmoids. And for the same reason, we are likely to offer these patients an an ileo, uh, an ileal pouch as our first line treatment and not an ileorectal anastomosis. Also, if they're greater than 20 polyps inside the rectum, we tend to say th there's, even if you take out the rectum and you leave the, sorry, take out the colon and you leave the rectum, they're likely to go on to malignant transformation anyway. The other considerations, Remember the Spiegelman's, Spiegelman's classification. We would um, follow them with that and always remember the management of desmoids. The tendency internationally is to uh, manage them with Sulindac and uh, Tamoxifen. Nadia will tell you of a fascinating patient that we've had. These can be really, really, really challenging patients. The management of massive desmoids can be incredibly complex, but suffice to say, the less you do with them surgically, the happier you will be. The less you do with them surgically, the happier the patient will be. If you can avoid operating, you should. So, I've talked a lot, and probably this is the most important part of the this, of my presentation because this is the interaction that I need to have with you. It is most important. Why, why did I spend the time going on and on and on about these, these conditions? The reason being is that all of us, including myself, including myself, must be mindful every moment of my practice when I see a colorectal malignancy, I must be thinking, could this fit a genetic abnormality? Because they are a golden opportunity to go find more patients with malignancy and to prevent it in a way unparalleled anywhere in Africa. We are not going to be in a situation where we are going to be able to initiate screening programs for a long time. 
There's got to be, there's got to be a lot of water under the bridge. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to enable us to create screening programs. But here is a situation where we can do our own case finding, and it is most important that we do it. And who do we need to get together if we're going to do this? If we're going to do it properly, we need to develop a multidisciplinary team that is aboard this, this uh, the, an understanding of chasing this. We need surgeons, we need oncologists, we need geneticists, we need genetic counselors, we need gastroenterologists, we need gynecologists all together to actually say, let's work together to make this happen. What does that mean? Let's just put it into, let's just put it into context. It means the likes of, once we've identified the patient, the surgeon doesn't do the counseling. The geneticist does the counseling. The geneticist takes that patient and goes through the genetic counseling. That is a good four hours worth of work. And they are trained. They've got three to four years of training to make them good counselors. I wouldn't want a genetic counselor to come and do an ileoanal patch on my patient. I, as a surgeon, should not be doing the counseling on, on my patient. Together with that, the gastroenterologists have to work hand in hand with us because once they're identified, you've got to then say, please gastroenterologist, go now do colonoscopes on these 10 relatives of this patient because we really suspect that these have HNPCC and we need to find out. So clinics need to develop where the, the interests and the specialities of these individuals are working together in unison to create a situation where we detect the patients. If we don't do that, we might as well not even begin. We need to work with a common interest. And, and let's keep, let's, let's be honest. I mean, I could quite easily be doing what? Fistulae? Hemorrhoids? Uh, surgery for ulcerative colitis? Yeah. In my day, there are a thousand and, a thousand and one things that could take my interest. It's the same for the geneticist. I can tell you now that the vast majority of them would be far more interested in Noonan syndrome and uh, Sweets syndrome. And so it goes, all these funny um, um, metabolic abnormalities, they just love them. And when you say, can you do some work for, for malignancies? They say, huh, why? So everybody needs to be focused and interested in this for it to actually work. So, where are we at present? I can say for myself in Joburg, I'm miles away from where I need to be. I can truly say that the Cape Tonians have one step ahead of us. They're one step, step ahead of us. I need to learn from them. I probably can learn from you. We can learn from each other. And it is through the, the establishment of common interest that we will be able to develop the skills that are required to come together to create these super specialist uh, areas of attention. By doing so, we transform the lives of large numbers of people and we do so effectively. We do so most effectively. I look forward to uh, having an impact on our patients as we go along. And I hope that the same is for you. It's been a pleasure being able to present to you. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them now. I'm six minutes over time.
Hello? Yes, Mr. Suleiman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Yeah? yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Rendan, for, for a very elegant talk, and uh, you manage well to put a very difficult topic in. Pleasure. Sorry, you're breaking up there. Mr. Salamai, I think Mr. Salamai is having some problem with the uh, internet yeah. connection. We'll be back at any time. Yeah. Um, maybe if I mute, I'm going to mute. I think that if I mute. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm having some trouble with the connection. You with me? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. You hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. I'm going to mute because then I think your your uh, connection. I'm sorry, I'm having a bit of uh, up and down with the connection. Yeah. I'm go I'm going to mute because I think it's better if if. The Do you have a question? Uh, thank you. You better take it. Uh, that's all right now. I think better now, yeah. Uh, uh, hello? Should we just use the the chat? The the um, if you could post it to me on chat. Uh, probably I'm having a problem with the connection. If at the moment I leave my comment toward the end, if anybody has any question or uh, comment, uh, please come forward and raise your hand and just uh, proceed. Yeah. I, probably I'm uh, having some problem with the, the connection. Anybody having a question, please proceed to make use of the time. Thanks. Um, I've got a question here from Nadir. Can I he ask questions or comments? Yeah. So I've got a question here posted by Nadir. How can we apply genetic screening for high risk patients in a poor country like Sudan? Um, Nadir, I think, I think that first of all, it needs to be centralized. Um, in a city like Khartoum, I would imagine. And I think that what needs to happen is that we need to develop a, an understanding of where these families are. And once we've done that, we develop road shows like they have done in, um, in Cape Town, where we take everything to them. One of the big problems in, in everything we do is access to care access to care and pathways of management are really important to understand if we are going to be effective. And this is particularly the case in the developing world. So when you, when you are thinking of a program like this, it's probably most important of, for, for you to think, how can I develop a, a system where there is access to my service and how do i develop a system with an elegant pathway to care that is impactful on the patient's outcome i hope i answer your question okay um it's, it's, yeah uh, it's with pleasure i'm able to talk to somebody in india it's, it just amazes me. Any other question? Uh, I'm Dr. Walid from Sudan. Hi, Dr. Um, Dr. Walid. Uh, we had two cases. Uh, yes. Young patient, less than 40 years, 
uh, they present with uh, ambulatory dinocarcinoma. We managed yeah. to do whipping operation for them. Yeah. And uh, less than two years, they present with uh, right colonic uh, ah. tumors. It was a non uh, hereditary, uh, non balivosis coli. Yeah. And they had uh, subtotal colectomy and they, they are on regular screening. And as you have mentioned in developing words where we face a lot of cases with adenocarcinoma, adenoma, and they are young. And uh, so we don't think of associated uh, colonic mutations or genetic mutation in all cases. Uh, Shall we do like a routine colonoscopy for such patients with adenal or adenocarcinoma less than 40 years? The first question. I would the say. Second the, question. For, yeah. Huh? yeah, sorry. Yeah, second question. The second question is the uh, patients with uh, uh, non with. Uh, Bolibosis coli, and they have their surgery, and they have these moid tumors, and associated with didinal polyps. Uh, we face a couple of cases where the weevil is impossible because you know that the small bowel mesentery is tethered to, to the posterior abdominal wall, where you cannot do a weevil operation safely. So, for such patients, can we do like an early weevil? Or uh, uh, preemptively before they develop the adenocarcinoma, if it is safe now nowadays, do it. If they have a dysmoid tumor and it is early stage, and uh, can we do like a, a preemptive weapon if they have ambulatory polyps? And thank you very much. Thank you, thanks you, Dr. Walid. Very interesting questions. So let me take them one at a time. I stand to be corrected, but in that circumstance where you have a presentation with an, a malignancy or an adenoma of the, uh, of the upper gastrointestinal tract, and you have a delayed presentation of the colonic malignancies, that's counterintuitive counter in, this, in this setting. In that circumstance, I think that you're going to find that that is part of um, an, an MLH, an MLH2 mutation. So it, it tells you a little bit about what type of mutation is occurring. And this is a very important point. It is most important that if we are going to do contact tracing, that we don't carpet bomb, sorry, it's not a, not a good term. We don't go and do all the genetic tests on, on the patient. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, they're presented like this, we're presented like that. I've got a, an aunt that this has happened, this has happened to the brother, and the geneticist puts the case together and says, hey, this looks like an M M U Y T H or whatever. This this is something different, and that means because we have this clinical presentation, we must look for this genetic abnormality. So what you are describing here is a very important part of genetic evaluation. That mm -hmm. it is the way in which the patient presents, the way in which the family presents that helps you determine what you should be doing in terms of investigation. It also tells you how you need to then follow that family up. Once you've identified the specific gene mutation, you then have an understanding of what you must do to do follow-up. That is a very important thing. And I think, I hope that answers your question about those very interesting patient, that very interesting patient uh, type that you presented. With regard to your question around the desmoids, I agree with you entirely. Desmoids are terrible 
people people don't realize how difficult that surgery is it is difficult difficult surgery to do so i take my hat off to you if you had had any luck with those patients but in the setting these patients with um upper git growths tend to have a slightly better uh malignant uh progression than the run-of-the-mill patients the, the other populations and it's probably related to the fact that there is an immune response to these malignancies as we've described so one should consider the possibility of endoscopically removing any growth particularly if there are large if they are large uh, polyps you can do it endoscopically if you do it endoscopically you must be aware of the fact that there is an increased risk of perforation of injury of hemorrhage doing that particular technique another thing to consider is that instead of doing a um, whipple's segmental duodenectomy and dissection off the the um, the pancreas is not, is a a reasonable way in which to deal with these conditions if they are pre malignant and what you should be using in that circumstance is in surveillance is the spiegelman's classification and i haven't gone into it much but the spiegelman's classification if you are dealing with a spiegelman 3 or particularly a spiegelman 4 and you have that problem where you've got desmoids that make it difficult to do the surgery what you might be doing is a segmental duodenectomy of your polyp that you are worried about and that you have tattooed endoscopically and that might save you a pancreatectomy in a very difficult spot i hope that answers your question yeah okay welcome yes, dr shalare yeah thank you thank you very much can you hear me yes uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brendan, for the very interesting and expertly um, uh, uh, expert speak uh, Pleasure. speech. Pleasure. And I, I am, I am a, a specialist. I am a surgeon, and I happen to do endoscopy. And um, we, we, we have, we use. Uh, we have a unit at Khartoum North Teaching Hospital. Uh, I would like to share some uh, information with you and with our younger colleagues that we, we have analyzed over uh, 3,000 cases. And we really found an alarming um, proportion of patients with colorectal cancer that is about uh, between eight and 10%, mm -hmm. eight and 10% of all the patients. My uh, colorectal cancer, particularly rectal cancer. Now, um, I should, we should really in the developing country, countries uh, be aware of the fact that the incidence is really increasing. What is really alarming is that uh, about 30% of these patients were below the age of 50. 30% of the, almost one third of them are below the age of 50. You always find that if you read the books, the textbooks, that colorectal cancer is a disease of people over the age of 50, but we found that 30% of our patients are below the age of 50. And even more alarming was that 7% were below the age of 30. And I think, as you rightly said, this uh, could be the point where we should 
really trace those who have cancer in a young age and see their families and screen their families or do some genetic tests on them. Unfortunately, you have, uh, I'm not sure we have all the tests for colorectal cancer. I hope if someone knows uh, uh, about anything in this regard to let me know. I think your talk has opened our eyes. Sorry? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, no, I'm listening. Your talk has our eyes to the importance of having some genetic surveillance services. And we should really, the message to our younger generation is that uh, you should, this is a very interesting and important important subject, important field that we should really um, go into it. And I was just wondering if South Africa have any training programs in genetics for this younger generation. Um, uh, Dr. Shalali, uh, yes. the, the answer to that is yes, um, that there are, that there is a good genetics department at WITS. There's a very good genetics department um, in uh, Cape Town. Uh, I'm going to be increasingly doing some work with a Professor Raj Ramesar, Ramesar, R-A-M-E-S-A-R, Ramesar, Raj Ramesar. And it's, it might be a name that you take down um, and somebody that you might want to get in contact with. He's, he's a pathologist working in Cape Town. Uh, but he's, he would be more than interested in, in um, you know, embarking upon exactly this. We as well would be delighted to have uh, people from up north to train. It, it would be really great. And it's, it's these common conversations that we can have that will uh, really empower not only you, but us to uh, to share this common conversation that needs to be had. And yes, I agree with you entirely that there is an increasing uh, there is an increase increasing burden of of colorectal cancer uh, in our communities. There needs to be science done with regard how we sort this problem out in our environment yeah in an impoverished environment in a yes. circumstance where we don't have the resources and we've got to we've got to think yes. we've got to think out the box we've got to think laterally we've got to think of new ways of detecting um of of identifying um uh, th those at risk i saw a really really interesting thing it, I don't know if you follow the Dukes Club uh, in the UK. The, the latest individual who won the Dukes Club um, competition had done a small study on using family history and then on top of family history, using um, uh, those just doing... Um, uh, fecal occult blood in those patients. So family history plus fecal occult blood and that produced a large number of people with colorectal cancer and and with with polyps. So it's things like that. You know, we, we need to think of ways in which to find these patients in our resource constrained circumstance. Sure. And uh, through you and through uh, this very interesting talk, I would like to just raise the flag for our colleagues. I think we need people, and particularly doctors, people to present whenever they have bleeding, the rectum, mm -hmm. and doctors uh, to not to treat and carry on treating patients as dysentery because most of these young patients go to the doctors 
and because we have high incidence of other infections such as amoebic and basilary dysentery and they start giving them antibiotics and anti, anti uh, things like metronidazole and things like that and the patient still bleeding and goes back to the doctor who also repeat the, the dose or repeat the course of antibiotics and then the patient gets fed up with this doctor because he didn't find any treatment. He goes to another doctor and he starts antibiotics again. So please, please do send these patients for at least sigmoidoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a service that I think is, is now available. Um, and don't just continue treating these patients because in the end they present with a huge advanced colorectal cancer. Um, I have another question if, if you sure. allow me, if the sure. time allows me. You have talked about important bowel preparation, the importance of bowel preparation. What do you use there? So we use Moviprep, um, which is a um, glycosylated colloid. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that that we think is the best. Um, and we do it in, but, but whatever you use, probably the most important thing is divided dose. So in the Divide. evening, the, the, the night before, and then on the day, just before, and allowing them, allowing the patient a clear, clear fluids, and then only to stop their clear fluids about three to four hours before we do the scope. And in that way, I think we get the, the, best, uh, the best preparation. And I think it, does, it doesn't really matter too much about what you use, it's that split dose that's most important. Nice. Um, Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, can I can yeah, I just answer you. some of these questions here? So, Muhammad Ali, to everybody, what are the factors to consider when you decide to do selective resection in Lynch syndrome patients with po positive colonoscope and um, future follow-up plan? That's a very good question. So, um, Muhammad, what we do is we are going to be do doing surveillance. <clears throat> on patients that are, first of all, that are within the family. If they're in the family and we find that they are, that they don't carry uh, MSI, then what we do is we scope them. If we scope them and we find a growth, we then do the, the specific genetic testing in them. If they come back then positive, those patients that have got an adenoma and carry the gene, they must have their colon out and they're given an ileorectal anastomosis. Okay? If we have a person who we know is a gene carrier, and we're doing colonoscopes. Remember we had said uh, every one to two years we're doing a scope. And if we do the scope and we identify a polyp in them, they must have their colon out. So basically it's this. If you have a person that carries the gene that has a polyp in their colon, their colon must come out. I hope that answers your question. Okay. And the follow-up thereafter is yearly sigmoidoscopy because by then they don't have a colon anymore and they've got an ileorectal. So what you're doing is you're scoping the pouch and there you are removing the adenomas as you go. Yeah? Okay, Mohammed. Hello. Okay, thank you, Professor. It's a pleasure. Uh, good evening, Dr. Bevington. Uh, this is Ahmed. Uh, how are you? Um, I've got a question. In, um, 
So are you recommending every resected colorectal cancer to be sent for analysis for MMR status? Because in, 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 a, in a financially constrained environment like in Sudan, so any like special criteria for patient that we can send to analyze them for MMR or for example, if the patient causes colorectal cancer below 40 or, or what kind of, to narrow the, the scope a little bit because to send every specimen to genetic testing, it is, um, I'm not sure is, is available there, but is difficult to, for most of the patients. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Well, these, you see, these are the things that we need to come up for ourselves. So, so what I described was a historical change in the way in which surgeons and geneticists were screening for Lynch syndrome. And it got more and more liberal. So forgetting the history and just relying on looking for MSI. And yes, it's expensive. And yes, it's a problem for us. So I think that what we need to do is we need to take a step back historically. And we need to say, let's use Bethesda criteria. That's what I, I, I would do is I would go back to the Bethesda criteria and say, let's use Bethesda criteria to select our patients and, and use that. So it's not as good. It's not as good as that. But yes, it, we have to take uh, the financial consideration. Uh, we have to make financial considerations here. So, so that's what I would do, Ahmed. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question from Dr. Ray. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Um, during screening for colorectal cancer, when is a colonoscopy contraindicated? Uh, uh, I, would, I would say, first and foremost, always be liberal with your colonoscopy. There are certain contraindications to it. So if there is a stricture, it mustn't be done. If there is obstruction, it mustn't be done. If there is a high risk of perforation, it mustn't be done. If the patient is anticoagulated, both naturally and as a consequence of uh, some form of medication, you've got to, you've got to take these precautions into, into consideration. <sighs> My old boss, Professor Utley, always used to say, the only thing that he would, uh, he would not do a colonoscope on is anything that wasn't, uh, that wasn't human. That is the way in which he put it. So we need to be very liberal in the way in which we, we choose our colonoscopy. But yes, we need, to, we need to be mindful of our responsibility when we do so. So, you know, I, I will bring to your attention uh, JAG. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this technique at the Joint Association of Gastroenterology of the UK and of Europe. Europe is closer to you than, than it is to me. And I think you should take the opportunity to go do these programs. They are brilliant. They really teach you how to do colonoscopies well. And you know what? Those, those courses make you realize that colonoscopy is actually easy. And it's, if you follow those techniques, if you follow those, those methods, you, everybody can do a colonoscopy. Um, okay, with, with regard to recording, uh, I will, anybody, can, can everybody yes. be in contact? Yes. Can everybody? Uh, uh, it's recorded, sir. It's recorded. Okay. So, okay. Uh, the, the yeah, I have a question. I have a question, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, I am Mohammed, uh, registrar of surgery from Sudan. Uh, my question yes. about what are the indications of for delayed surgery in asymptomatic patient of familial adenomatous polybodies, and for how long we can delay this surgery? Okay. So, um, Mohammed. It, it really depends upon how many polyps you're dealing with. 
So remember what I had said, if the, it depends where the gene mutation is in the exon. Remember, it's like a string. And if the gene mutation is occurring at certain parts of the string, either you have lots and lots and lots of polyps or you have very few polyps. And in those cases where you have lots and lots and lots of polyps, you've got to take those colons out when the patient is very young. If there are very few polyps, and particularly if there are right-sided, sorry, if there are very few polyps, then those polyps, in, in that circumstance, you can wait longer before you take the colon out. Does that answer your question? I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you, sir. You know, it's a pleasure. So, so what you will read, what, um, Mohammed, um, what you probably are a little bit confused about is that they, if you go read about FAP, they never tell you, take the polyp out when they are 20. It gives you a, a very nebulous sort of suggestion as to when you do it. And the reason being is that feature of, polyp, of FAP that the time at which the cancer is occurring is different for each and every patient and is really dependent upon that polyp load. Okay. Brendan, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for, for the interesting topic. Just, I have a question about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Yes. Yeah, uh, the issue of uh, like polyps in the upper GI has been raised but I don't know what's the effect of the non-steroidal on the polyp of the upper GI. So if it, it can be used as, um, I mean, in protective measures after colectomy for uh, uh, FAP or uh, hereditary non-polyposis coli, after colectomy, especially in, in with, um, I mean, um, uh, environmental constra constraints uh, in case we don't have a good follow-up or surveillance? Um, not again? Yeah. To give you the answer, nobody knows. So, if you've got the patients, maybe that is a point at which you could do your own research. You could, if you were able to follow these patients up, you could set up a, a study in which to look at that because nobody knows that answer. I know, I know that that is the case. Nobody knows that answer. And here's the thing about, about a lot of what I've talked about tonight. A lot of this is based not on double blind control randomized trials, this is dependent upon expert opinion. And the reason being is that the numbers of patients that we're talking about around the world at this moment in time is not big. So, you know, there's, there's a responsibility uh, that we have to make sure that we are are looking at this from a scientific point of view. So um, I can't give you an answer to that because there is no answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, if FAP patient has concomitant CA colon and duodenum, duodenum, what operation first? That is going to be a very, very rare circumstance because they developed the colon cancer well before the duodenal lesion. So the, the nature of the pathology usually sorts that requirement out because you need to take the colon cancer out before the duodenum. The duodenum won't have developed uh, before the colon cancer. Yeah. Okay. No more questions? Yeah. Dr. Suleiman. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Nadir. Sorry, I, I lost you for some time because of connection problem. But uh, I noted from the question that you stimulated a lot of uh, 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 
questions and the comments from our colleagues. And I'm sure that we are running short of time, but really it is a very stimulating talk. And in particular in a situation like ours in Sudan, where probably we are facing the same problems and the pattern of colorectal cancer is not different from the situation in South Africa. Uh, but unfortunately, we are lagging behind in terms of genetic testing. And we're mainly with the, depending on familiar history, which is some, most of the time is not giving an answer. But I think it is an area now, so we have to work hard on the genetic testing side. Because now, as you rightly said, the genetic tests are decide when to operate and, and the type of operation which you need to do. Uh, most of our patients, 40% of our patients are below 40 years of age. So probably we are missing a lot of Lynch uh, type of disease. Uh, very stimulating talk, uh, Dr. Brandon. I'm sure that there's a lot of we can share with your experience from now on about what we need to do, how to overcome the problem of genetic testing, the cheap. I think we lost connection again. Oh. Uh, sorry, I'm not having any yeah. luck to you sure. receiving yeah. here. And uh, as I said, there is a lot to share with your experience, and I'm sure there is a line of connection between, between both of, between Khartoum and uh, your hospital. And I am sure that uh, we have to stimulate a lot of joint work. And uh, since we are sharing the same problems, the same pattern of diseases in Sudan and in South Africa. Uh, thank you very much for your elegant presentation. And uh, sure. I'm sure this will be a start of a series of talk about your experience in colorectal surgery. Uh, and yeah. thank you very much for everybody who joined. And I am sure that we'll miss part of the connection, because part of the talk because of the connection. There is a recorded lecture, and I think the YouTube will be the answer for those. We miss this talk. Thank you very much. It's only a pleasure. My pleasure.